In my previous video, I built my new astrophotography rig. In this video, I upgrade and optimize it to turn it into a very capable little platform. Let's assemble the version two of the rig. The main difference here is the remote focuser mount is integrated into the rear ring. One of the main issues I have with mounting this lens is with the front ring, the lens barrel is rather soft plastic. So when you squeeze on it, it deforms the lens barrel it becomes uh, somewhat out of round and that results in binding in the focusing and what that ends up manifesting as is basically like backlash in the system it's kind of hard to demonstrate this on camera but you can definitely feel it the result is that the front mounting ring i basically have to have pretty loose it's kind of just sort of barely on there The front mounting ring has this step here to clamp onto the both diameters of the front lens barrel, which would make for a really nice effective clamp if it wasn't for the soft deforming plastic. This is the SV Boney SV165 30 millimeter mini guide scope. And this is the SV Boney SV905C guide camera. Initially, I hoped to be able to run this mount entirely unguided, but I found that it wasn't quite as consistent as I was hoping for longer exposures, so I upgraded to adding the auto guider. I removed the standard dovetail mount from the guide scope, and instead I'm just mounting directly to the top plate of my rig, just to make an overall shorter, low-profile rig. With the rig assembled, you can really see the binding in the focus ring and how it looks like backlash. I've changed to using this lens mount from ZWO. As far as I know, ZWO is the only one that makes a Canon EF bayonet uh, female style mount uh, to telescope thread adapter that I can find, I, I couldn't find any others. I purchased the version with a filter drawer, which at the time I thought was somewhat of a luxury, but now I can see that it is really kind of more of a necessity. You install various length spacers on the back of the adapter here to get the correct back focus for your camera. I'm actually not at the correct back focus, I'm actually inside, I'm actually a little bit, sensor a little bit too close, and the reason for that is the lens has a, like a lot of photography lenses has a hard stop on uh, at the infinity focus. And that means that the autofocuser won't be able to focus past infinity. Uh, so you can't get that autofocus uh, parabola that uh, you're used to seeing if you're familiar with autofocusing. The, uh, the autofocuser needs to focus past and then come back. So um, by being inside the focus a little bit, I can actually travel uh, past infinity and then come back. I don't know if this causes uh, any other optical issues with my images or not. They seem to be coming out fine. Uh, let me know in the comments if uh, this is a really bad idea. The filter that I'm using is the Optolong L Enhance.
User Dur Pitt on the Cloudy Nights forums generously shared this 3D printable aperture mask for the Rokinon lens. This stops the lens down to about f2.8 without having uh, diffraction spikes from the internal aperture blades. The remote focuser mount situation still isn't that great, and I think another revision on these parts is in order to uh, clean this up a bit. The computer that I'm using to run all this hardware is the Melee, Melee, Melee Quieter 4C Fanless Mini PC. This version has 16 gigs of RAM and an Intel N100 quad-core CPU. I found this thing works absolutely perfectly once I have spaced it out. I've added these aluminum uh, extrusion spacers in here and I actually use a little bit of thermal compound too so they act kind of like a little bit of a heat sink and this PC has been great. And as one final touch I added these end caps with 3D printed glow-in-the-dark inlays. Here we are now at the Chino Hills Observatory, AKA my apartment balcony. I've added this folding room divider to give a little bit of extra privacy, but also help block a little bit of that extra light glare from the bright lights on the side of the buildings. I've marked the position of my tripod feet, so every time I go set my rig out, I can put it in pretty much the exact same position. A bit of a juggling exercise to extend the legs on my tripod, but by raising the rig up nice and high, I can actually see over the roof of the building, which gives me much more view of the night sky. Also looking at this video, I suppose I could zip tie or Velcro strap those cables to the tripod legs and kind of neaten that up a little bit. I do have kind of a rat's nest of cables here and uh, ordering some cables of the ideal length would be a, a nice way to tidy this up a little bit. So now I will show you what my horizon looks like. This is looking east. I got a big tree there. And then as I swing to the north, you can see I got a bit of a gap. So I got like a gap there and then I got another tree that's kind of northeast. And then where those chimneys are, that's kind of north. And you can see the roof as I look west and then swing it around down to the south. And I got some more trees and then back to that tree at the east. Polaris is just above the roof line right around here. Once everything is powered up, I get out my tablet and remote desktop into the PC. Then I start PhD and connect to the equipment. And then I launch Nina. Once in Nina, I connect to all my devices. Then I go over to the telescope tab and unpark and set the tracking rate of my mount. Then I go over to the imaging tab, make sure my mount is tracking. Then I just do a quick two second exposure to make sure everything's connected and I can see stars. Next, I'll run the autofocus if it looks like maybe my image is out of focus. I usually don't have to do this uh, night to night. It, maybe it just depends on if I've been messing with things and might have bumped the focus ring on my lens. Then it's time to polar align, and for that, I use the three point polar alignment plugin. Like a lot of things with Nina, I am super impressed with how quick and easy this is something, a task that used to be quite tedious uh, in the past. The plugin takes three separate images at three different locations and then calculates your error in polar alignment, then tells you how much to adjust the mount in azimuth and altitude in order to get that alignment on track. 
It then proceeds to take looping two second exposures while you make adjustments and it remeasures your alignment error. So you just kind of keep going at this, iterating a little bit of adjustment, a little bit of adjustment, and eventually you dial it in and get it pretty accurate. I'm able to regularly get around 30 arc seconds of error or less. With the Mount Polar aligned, I'll go over to the sequencing tab and I'll load a sequence that I've been using for the last few nights and then basically you just hit start. I really can't rave enough about how good a piece of software Nina is. This is so much better about than what I was doing in the past. It really does everything that you need and once you kind of get the hang of it it's just super easy and quick to use uh, it's just it's great next i need to manually rotate the camera but because i don't have a rotator i have to rotate the whole lens and camera assembly to do that i need to remove my remote focuser because otherwise Turning the lens would turn the focus ring and then my image would be out of focus. I have to use a hex key to loosen the clamps to rotate the lens. This would maybe be better with thumb screws, but it's really not that big of a deal to get a tool out. I, you know, I don't need to do that all that often. Usually it takes a couple of tries to get it right, but then I tighten everything back down and reattach the remote focuser. Then it reruns the autofocus. I'm not quite sure why it's plotting so many points here. It doesn't usually do that, but it has to do with that I you know, moved the manual focus ring when I was rotating the camera lens. And with the focus complete, it just starts imaging. And that whole process, if I have my sequence set up ahead of time, really only takes me, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes to get everything out on the balcony, plugged in, turned on, booted up, you know, calibrated and imaging. We had a lot of moonlight that night, it's almost a full moon. So there's a lot of sky glow, but you can see I'm still able to get some pretty decent data. Okay, enough of all that. Let's take a look at some of the images I've been able to capture. This is the North American and Pelican Nebula region. This image is fun because it was the first thing that I started to shoot uh, with this rig when I first started, so it's cool to see the progression, how much better I was able to do. The Flaming Star and Tadpole Nebula region. This image is about 10 hours of data. The California Nebula, this object is really perfect for the field of view of this rig. This is my longest exposure so far, about 17 and a half hours on the Seder region with Crescent Nebula. And lastly, the wonderful Veil Nebula. This is about 12 and a half hours of exposure time. I really love seeing the color contrast here with the red hydrogen and the bluish green oxygen gases. Well, that about wraps it up. I am super stoked to have this thing up and running and working as good as it is. This has been quite a fun project imaging from my backyard, and I've yet to even get this out under some really dark skies. Hopefully, I will get to do that soon. Thank you guys for watching the video, checking out my content. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to support the channel, you can like the video, subscribe, consider joining the channel here on YouTube or checking out my Patreon. I really appreciate your support and I've got more content on the way that I look forward to sharing with you.